Welcome to Salesology, conversations with sales leaders, the art of faster, easier, more profitable sales. When you're ready to transform your sales for today's transforming market, we've got you covered with your host, the queen of cold calling and founder of Salesology, award-winning author, speaker, sales trainer, and coach, Wendy Weiss. Hi, welcome to Salesology, conversations with sales leaders, the art of faster, easier, more profitable sales. And I'm your host, Wendy Weiss. I am the founder of Salesology, creator of the Salesology Prospecting Method, and I'm also known as the queen of cold calling. And uh, today, my very special guest is Lisa Dennis. She is the president of Knowledgeance Associates. Um, She is a global marketing and sales strategist. She's a consultant and an author, and her consulting practice focuses on value proposition and messaging development. So vitally important. Um, She also focuses on marketing strategy and uh, account-based marketing and sales enablement content and programs. She is the author of Value Propositions That Sell, Turning Your Message into a Magnet That Attracts Buyers. And her upcoming book is Do You Speak Buyer? An Integrated Messaging Playbook for Marketing and Sales that's coming out in 2025. And I can't wait to grab my own copy when it comes out. Welcome, welcome, Lisa. Thank you so much, Wendy. Happy to be here. Okay, so let's let's dive in. Um, how did you get so interested in value propositions and what makes them tick? I think it was it was two things. Number one, back in the day, long ago, I was a product manager for the smallest, least popular product that we had, and it forced me to figure out how do I message both my customers who did like it and my salespeople who couldn't care less? So that sort of also pushed me onto the sales side. The thing that really got me focused on value props actually was Jill Conrath, who is obviously a very well-known global sales expert. And I had met her and we sat down to have a cup of coffee and she had read my stuff and said, you know what? You'll love this, Wendy. She said to me, you need to be the queen of value props. I'm like, what? She said, no, that's your lane. I mean, you obviously are passionate about it. Nobody owns that. You should do it. And I was kind of blown away. After that conference, two weeks later, a box showed up at my door from UPS, no return address. I opened it up and there was a tiara in there. And it was from Joe. And she's the one who really pushed me to the path to write the book, to codify what I'm doing. And it's been the best move ever because I love it. And I'm doing some great work with some great companies. Okay. That's a wonderful story. And, um, but you're not wearing your tiara today, which is kind of disappointing. (laughs) It's packed, unfortunately. (laughs) Okay. Um, So let's start at the beginning. What exactly is a value proposition? Well, This is an interesting question because most people and the standard definition of a value prop is that it's a statement about your product or service or solution, what it brings to the customer and why it's different than any other. I happen to think it's slightly different. I think a really good buyer focused value proposition is um, communicates your understanding and demonstrates that you get where your buyer is, goals, challenges, uh, pains, how you solve those, and then what sets you apart. So as opposed to demonstrating knowledge about your product, service, or solution, I believe you should demonstrate your knowledge of the buyer, the prospect that you're trying to attract. Okay, well, I I am with you right there 100%. Um, but this sounds long. Uh, that's that's interesting. So people are always very fixated on the length of a value proposition. And they often think about a value prop as being a tagline. And actually, a tagline is something that you extract from a value prop. 
An elevator pitch is something that you extract from a value prop. A really short value prop actually isn't enough to be a good foundation to create messaging. So every time you're doing copywriting, you're kind of like starting with a blank sheet of paper. So I have a a process that results in a two page, two PowerPoint templates, two pager that really outlines your message, your value proposition statement. And it has your customer's pains listed. It has your target audience. And the second page, which is the secret sauce, where you talk about and extract what are the real value drivers, key points of value in the head of your buyer that they almost use as a mental checklist as they're evaluating you and others. How do you quantify that value driver? And then what's your objective third-party proof? So you actually have a platform to build all the messaging that you want. Okay. So that that's very interesting to me. And I'm wondering how you go about doing that second page. So if every good value proposition starts with some decent research after you've done your segmentation, a lot of uh, one of the common mistakes people make is that they think they need one value prop to cover everybody and everything. And I have a mantra, a one size value proposition, one size fits all value proposition fits nobody. Because your target audiences are very different, different levels of title, different um, industry verticals. So you got to get really narrowed in on who's the most foundational, important prospect or customer target that you have. Do some research on what's going on with them. Major issues in the industry, challenges or goals or objectives you know that they have. Use that to build out your statement. And your value prop statement The buyer focus one has three sections. Section one, which is the first one or two lines, right? And already, you know, it's going to be longer than normal. One or two lines that coalesces what's their issue. This is what I call the mirror part of your value prop. When they hear it, see it, read it, they see themselves. Then you have your offer piece, a couple of sentences. Then you have your differentiator. When you have that all together, you can go back to the research and the, and, the, and the listing you've done of what their needs, pains, or problems are and extract the most important value drivers that you haven't covered in your value prop to extend your message. Well, it sounds to me, correct me if I'm wrong, but what I think I'm hearing is that this is really more of a um, foundational document as opposed to let's say a sales script. Right, but you can pull a, absolutely true. Out of this foundational two pager, you can pull sales scripts, elevator pitches, taglines as needed. You can use it as the basis for making sure you've got the right themes and right messaging points in marketing copy, collateral websites. What it does is it ensures consistency. It ensures that you never have to start with a blank page, which tends to make people fracture their message all over the place. And you've got one kind of place for it. The other really value add is if I'm aiming at a single market and, 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 and I'm aiming at three different levels of, of prospects, I can take that first one and I can version it for the second title and the third title, right? So again, I don't have to start from scratch. They're connected, but not the same. I can do the same thing with the vertical. If I'm moving to another vertical market, I can also take foundational vertical market one, number one, and all I have to do is change up maybe some of the titles and the customer issues or pains, and you want to get some industry language in there. And I'm only touching the beginning of your value prop. It's a great way to be as targeted as you can without having to start from scratch every time. Okay. So um, in preparing for this interview, I um, was browsing through your website. And one of the things I read uh, you had a big banner that said, if you ask 10 prospects or customers, what is your value proposition? Would they say the same? Uh, would they give the same answer you do? And I thought that was uh, really very interesting. And, and so I'm wondering as what part of your process involves, because you said market, you know, you said do the research. Are you also interviewing prospects and existing customers? 100%. When I do work with that, um, we are we do a set of internal interviews, marketing, sales, customer service or customer success, typically uh, some people in the executive team. 
Then we go out and we look at customers. I usually want to see, I want to talk to two or three customers who adore you. I want to talk to two or three customers who are still customers, but they're not running around throwing testimonials about you everywhere. And if you're brave, I want to talk to two or three customers that either said no to a proposal or left you. And then we roll all of that up. And out of that comes ideas, themes, gaps, opportunities. And we marry that with industry research as well to be able to say, okay, here are some potential messaging directions you could take. I usually come up with between three to four directions. Usually the customer, the client, my client will say, can we use all of them? No. (laughs) Can we combine them all into one? No. (laughs) You've got to make some choices here because clarity matters, right? But it's a really great way. When I do a live workshop, and I've done a lot of team workshops around this, where we bring in product teams, marketing teams, bring some salespeople in, and I do that question. I have everybody write down the value prop. I have never yet in over 15 years literally had an or a group that could pretty much get the value prop even close. Everybody's is all over the map and it's always a showstopper. It's a good way to get everybody's attention at the beginning of a workshop, but it's true. It usually happens. So I'm also curious. Um, I mean, one of the things that I look for when we're doing sales scripts and, and uh, prospecting scripts, and you want to be able to get someone's attention pretty quickly um, the question that I always ask is what's the thing they hate lead with that. If you, if you can fix it, of course, you know, what's, what's the thing they hate and drives them crazy and makes them miserable. And um, I'm often pushing my clients to use more emotional language right. in the way they, their elevator speech, the way they talk to prospects, because uh, it's not black and white. It actually is. You're looking for the thing they hate that they want to fix that you can fix. So I'm, I'm curious where in your process does, I see you nodding. So our audience can't see us, but um, Lisa's nodding. So I, <laughs> I'm, I'm gathering that you're looking for that emotional context as well. I am because it, it actually makes your value prop sound a little more interesting as opposed to sounding like you read it out of a brochure. Uh, I'm looking for challenges, right, in those interviews. And there's questions built around these in these customer interviews, as well as doing some of the industry research. I'm looking what challenges they're having, what pains or problems are really pervasive. But I also have a, a kind of a slightly different opinion is I, I, everybody always focuses on solving the pain. But fixing pain is not the only thing your buyers are focused on, actually. They're trying to get ahead. They're trying to be more competitive. They're trying to be more innovative. They want to step above. They want to differentiate. So I also try to look at where are there, is there anything in particular that you're really, that this particular group is really trying to strive for, or that there there's this real, you know, new innovation that you want to go further. And from a sales perspective, if I've done my, my account and my uh, stakeholder research well enough, I should be able to get even closer, right, Wendy, to be able to say, okay, I'm trying to prepare this script specifically for this meeting I have coming up, right? Or this group of stakeholders that I'm trying to, you know, to conduct some discovery with. And you can get even closer to look at that. Yes. Um, I, was, I was speaking more specifically about an elevator speech or a prospecting script where you've got to get someone's attention quickly. But right. I think we're pretty much saying the same thing because it, even if someone, even if an organization has a specific goal, they want to be someplace other than where they are, um, that's kind of a pain point because they're not there. Certainly. Yeah, you can certainly interpret it that way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I just always want to make sure that we're not just focusing on things that are broken and need being fixed, because not everything that's broken is an organization willing to pay money to fix. Depends on how deep the pain is, right? Right. So, so it's like, what's the trade-off? Do I fix this and invest dollars to do that? Or here's something that could really get me ahead. Do I invest there? So I'm always trying to see and think about which is most important, right? I mean, think about the last year, right? Everybody has pains, but everybody's looking at Gen AI as a way to get ahead. Some of that's to fix pains. Some of that is to get ahead. So it's always kind of this balance. Absolutely. So we're going to pause now for a word from our sponsor. 
Um, but uh, when we come back, I'm going to hold Lisa's feet to the fire and ask her some more questions about uh, creating that uh, buyer-centered value proposition. So now, a word from our sponsor, the Salesology Vault. Just about every guest that I've interviewed on the Salesology Conversations with Sales Leaders podcast has had a free gift for our listeners, and that does include my special guest today, Lisa Dennis. She has a gift for all of our listeners. So what we've done is we've taken all of those gifts and we put them all in one place just for you. We call it the Salesology Vault, and it is packed full of free gifts from sales leaders, sales experts, marketing gurus, revenue generation experts. And we add another gift every week when we release a podcast. Every Monday, we release a podcast and we add a gift. So you can log in as often as you'd like and download as many gifts as you'd like. It's it's all free. Um, So the link to the Salesology Vault is in the show notes. So as soon as you finish listening to this podcast, go to the show notes, click on the link, grab your free gifts. And I am back with my special guest, Lisa Dennis, who is the president of Knowledgeance Associates. And uh, we are talking all things value prop, value propositions. Let's be more formal here. And um, so, so I'm curious, what are some of the mistakes that people make, companies make when they're working on their, their value proposition? The most common one is the value proposition is very inwardly centered. So it, it, it talks about only the company, its own company. It'll talk about its own products, its own services. It leads with, with the name of the company, or if it's an individual entrepreneur, it's always a dead giveaway when the first word of your value proposition is the word I. That says to me, oh, you're going to pitch me now, aren't you? Right? So that's one of those things that do you want to engage someone or do you want to give somebody the heads up? Guess what? You're about to be pitched. So I suggest instead of inside out, which is what most of them are, starting from the inside and pushing the message out, I want to flip it and go outside in. Lead with some language about the buyer in their, in with the words that they use, right? That's the research part because that's more engaging, right? There's something I always say when I'm talking with new customers. If, if you were, if I invited you to, to, to lunch, Wendy, okay. And I want you to be blatantly honest. Okay. And you threw away everything you were taught about being charming and gracious and all that. And I asked you, Wendy, what should we talk about right now? You or me? What would your answer be? Me, me. Hello. <laughs> exactly. That's human nature. We're, we are in love with ourselves in one way or another. And every buyer and prospect you face is the same way. And so, but we keep writing value props that are about ourselves and our own business, trying to attract people who are more interested in what they are doing. So that's the biggest, most common mistake I see. Can you give us uh, an example, like a before and after? Uh, I, so that's harder because it's it's like memorizing them, right? Um, I just did, um, I run a value proposition workshop um, every month for the Houston Real Estate Association. They're the largest association of of real estate in the country. I took one of their members value prop and she began with, I am the top producing broker in our office. And she had uh, either I or me seven times in her value prop. Okay. And the other issue with it was, is that it would, it was fairly generic and meaning it would, you could say it to anybody whether you're a first-time home buyer, whether you're a downsizer, whether you're an investor looking to buy uh, you know, condos. So it wasn't, it was a one-size-fits-all. When we finished, we started with something like buying in this fast, pressure-filled market has never been harder. Um, buyers are, are putting cash down. Um, bidding wars are happening. Um, is it priced right? Getting ready to go to market with your house is complicated. That was the beginning. 
And then we, we built in her offer. And then we came up with a couple of things that were very differentiated. And we were able to build three different versions because she was focusing on three very distinct segments. So it ends up talking about them, which is why they're talking to you. If they're talking to you or you're trying to attract them, that's what they want to hear. Because they already like know about your, your business. They've already been online, right? Now they're trying to get a sense of what's their understanding of where I'm at and what I am. Because I don't really care what you offer me, Wendy, until I understand that you get me, that you've done some research on me. Does that make sense? Oh, that makes perfect sense. It actually is. Um, it's something that I say to my clients all the time that when they're, they're prospecting, uh, I don't want their prospect saying, oh, another, another broker called me, another exactly. salesperson called me. Exactly. I, I want them to say, oh, Lisa gets me. Yeah. It's really funny. I'm working with a client right now and um, we just brought in a new uh, a woman, VP of sales. She's fabulous. We were having a conversation about some sales enablement work I'm doing for her new team. And she was talking about some of the prospecting emails that she gets. And she got one and literally it had a little animated graphic and it was like this little like Kilroy face looking over a fence with its eyes blinking going, are you there? And she, and as she looked at me, she gave a look at discuss. She said, grow up. What is this all about? I mean, completely irrelevant and annoying, right? And the desire just to get attention in any way possible misses the point of the fact that not every buyer is primarily interested in themselves and we're not leveraging it the way we could. So what are some more ways we could leverage that? One of the things that's really good about doing the customer interviews as part of this process is to literally lift language right out of those interviews. I do them, I record them, I transcribe them. What words are they using to describe their needs? What words are they using to literally come up with a list of words that you can embed in your value proposition, as opposed to trying to reword it into corporate speak? It's a simple thing, doesn't often get done. Um, <laughs> right? Yeah, the audience can't see me, but I've like got a big grin on my face and I'm nodding my head. Um, that's something we have our clients interview some of their clients to capture the language um, because jargon is deadly. And the thing that I find to be so interesting i'm wondering if you have encountered this is the complete resistance so many salespeople have to using anything other than their industry jargon and yes. um one of the questions i have them ask when they do these interviews i'll, I'll say what was going on two questions what was going on before you hired us how did you feel about that Mm. They never ask, how did you feel about it? Never. Right. right. Which is such a, a key question. It's also a, a nice thing. If, if they're not feeling hot about it, better to know now than later, right? When yes. rules are coming up. Yes. The jargon thing is fascinates me because there's all, I always get pushed back like, well, this is interesting. Or they know what it means. Here's the thing. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. And if they don't, they'll never tell you. They're not going to raise their hands and go, what does that mean? Right. I have hives when I see acronyms in in, in value propping and messaging. I, I, I absolutely have eyes. If you can't say it in plain English, it's not going to help you to be more complex about it. So one of the questions I often ask is when I look at drafts and we're building and I'm like. Has any of you ever heard a client use this name? This word. And I mean, some of the stuff is really esoteric, right? You know, I, I do a lot of startup work. Um, you know, I, m most of my work is in enterprise, but I've been working with Techstars, which is a, a an incubator, global incubator company over the last six years. And so I've got a lot of really small, bright, brilliant entrepreneurs. And the language is so complicated. And I'm like, does anyone other than you guys? <laughs> I mean, unless you're selling to yourself, this is pretty complicated. And some of these words, people are not going to know. If you can't boil it down to make it plain and simple then you're missing your mark. Yeah. And confused prospects don't buy. 100%. Yeah. 
Um, so I know, uh, Lisa, you have a gift for all, for our audience. Please share details of your gift. I do. Um, I have a PDF of my book, Value Propositions That Sell. Um, what I want to say is it's a practitioner's guide as opposed to a theory. So in it is um, a set of downloadable templates that you can use, and it breaks down the steps to building a buyer-focused value prop uh, one piece at a time because it's modular to build those two, those two one-pagers. Um, the other thing is, is that there are two um, real case studies in there. One of them is um, the work I did with a solo entrepreneur. You get to see the whole process, including the drafts. So you can see how it involves and the kinds of questions you need to ask yourself to make it better. The second one is a mid-market company. They called themselves a 10-year startup because they got to a certain point and then they went flat. No growth for two years. And they were selling to a non-technical audience using technical language. Classic example. And you get to see what that journey was like. So Justin, so I think the, the value add here for people, and it's worth uh, getting it and reading it, is that not only do you get the templates, but you really get to see how you actually use them and how you evolve them and iterate till you get a really solid uh, value prop at the end. Okay, wonderful. And so um, the link to Lisa's book is going to be in the show notes. So as soon as you finish listening to this podcast, go to the show notes, click on the link, download Lisa's book. Um, I know I'm going to do that as soon as we finish this interview. And uh, Lisa, I know uh, if people want to get in touch with you. Where can they find you? Well, first of all, you can find me on LinkedIn for sure, because I'm there. You can go to valueproposition.com. Um, which is all things value prop. And, uh, and I'm also available at uh, Lisa Dennis, L Dennis at knowledgeance.com. So I hope to see you. Okay, wonderful. And in case you didn't have a chance to write that all down, um, no worries because uh, Lisa's email address, her website, and the link, to, uh, the link to her LinkedIn will all be in the show notes. So uh, to connect with Lisa, finish listening to this podcast go to the show notes, click on the links. And uh, you have been listening to Salesology, Conversations with Sales Leaders with my special guest, Lisa Dennis, president of Knowledgeance. And uh, we've been talking all things value proposition. And if you um, have found value in listening to today's podcast, then please think about one business leader, one entrepreneur, uh, one uh, president, CEO, solopreneur, somebody that you know that you think might also find value in listening to this podcast. And please do share the link with them. And until we meet again, visualize yourself surrounded by cash, really large bills. You've been listening to Salesology, conversations with sales leaders, the art of faster, easier, more profitable sales. Be sure to follow so that you don't miss a single episode. And while you're at it, please leave a rating and review and be sure to share it with your friends. Tune in every week for more exciting insights and wisdom on transforming sales. And until next time, visualize yourself surrounded by cash, very large bills.